Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Cynthia Guerrero. I'm the new artistic director of Bayes Artists Project, and welcome everybody to Bayes Artists. So basically, the idea of tonight is because um, maybe some of you might not be familiar with my own curatorial practice, Jan, the director, uh, wanted me to like share basically um, how I've developed recent exhibition projects and how I've also worked in different uh, formats in terms of my work as an independent curator, but also my work institutionally as an adjunct curator for the Tate, that if there's time, I'll make time to have the second part of, the, of tonight to talk more about uh, what exactly do I do at the Tate and just to give a little introduction of what the museum in London is doing at the moment in terms of exhibition making, uh, art history making, and politics of collection. So that would be at the end. But I decided for the beginning of the talk and, and the first presentation to give you a little bit of an insight to an exhibition that I did recently, a biennial in Ireland. Uh, which was an international exhibition. And the process of it, I will walk you through it. And uh, some of it has to do with history from uh, Ireland, which I personally found very close to certain historical processes in Latin America. And you might, maybe we'll have a discussion afterwards if there are some relationships even with context here related to art and nationhood. Uh, that might be similar uh, in, the, in the Philippines as well, because of religion, post-colonial process that you will see that they emerge from the artworks that I'll present. Because some of the works are uh, perhaps unfamiliar to many of you, I will try to be as generous as I can. And partly the selection of this work and the associations that uh, you might see uh, will give you a sense of how uh, in recent years I've related certain art practices to others and potentially this might be also a way that we see some, not all, of the projects that we develop here but it's just an introduction again to the practice. So I'm going to begin and okay so just to give you a bit of institutional history. Uh, so EVA International is an art event that's been happening in Limerick, which is like the third size city after Dublin and Cork in Ireland. So it's like very rural, provincial, but it's not rural. It is a city, but it's not exactly the metropolis of uh, Ireland. And uh, yet, since the 1970s, they have this event that started as a salon, like the name Eva comes from a very boring, um, well, it's basically, it means exhibition of visual arts. <laughs> there's no, <laughs> there's nothing behind uh, There's no one called Eva. No, everybody thinks like, oh, it's, who's Eva? But basically it started in the moment in the 70s where actually it was radical to create a platform for visual arts rather than plastic arts or fine arts, no? So the visual became something, no? it was this moment where the idea of bringing visual arts across the world it happened. The idea that artists were visual artists and, as, and not fine art, fine art artists was something that at that time was kind of seen radical. So it was always international, so, uh, and it was always, always curated in the sense that a juror came to select works that were uh, brought from an open call, which the open call system still exists. It's one of the very few biennials that has an open call system. Nowadays, it's not only the artists that are shown come from the open call, but they're also invited directly. Anyway, and by the 2000s, it kind of like evolved into a biennial biennial, and it rebranded itself. Uh, in the like 80s, it was called e Eva Plus, 
because again at that time the idea of the visual was a bit redundant and there was already net art video so people were thinking okay it's more than the visual no so in 2004 the institution had to be rebranded because how it was written back then it was E B plus A and when you Google as you know if you uh, type plus it the type place automatically takes you to another place. So it's like E V plus something, you know? Which is the paradox because they had placed the plus precisely because of how technology had changed. And that's just a little bit of trivia <laughs> of the institution and uh, the history of the institution. So I was invited to create the 38th edition, and uh, just to give you a bit of context, uh, if you don't know the geography, so Dublin is looking towards the water that separates the United Kingdom, the former colonial power uh, that invaded, annexed Ireland, uh, and Limerick is right there on the west coast, and it's kind of part of the western world of Ireland, which is quite different to the north. And as you know, in every country, there's all these idiosyncrasies to the people from the north, and people from the south, people from the south, and people from the west. And let's say the core of Irishness is actually comes from this part, like the southern western part. No, the more anglophile comes uh, from the north. So. And how I started this um, exhibition process and proposal was around um, the painting of an artist from the 1920s, 1930s, um, very active in those decades, which are the decades uh, right after um, Ireland became independent. No? Um, as I just mentioned, Ireland was one of the first, let's say, literally like overseas colonies of the British Empire and was one of the, well, African colonies and became independent in the 60s, but Ireland also became independent only until the 20th century, like uh, after 1916 and a series of civil um, war unrest. And it, that it finally, let's say in the 20s, became like a real republic. No? And in this context of republicanism, uh, one of the main projects of modernizing and becoming independent and making Ireland part of an industrial revolution that actually the British had a, a limited them uh, was to bring electricity to most of the country. So in order to do that, they constructed a huge hydroelectric dam uh, which was during construction in 1927, uh, it was considered the biggest hydroelectric dam before Hoover Dam in the US. No? Like Hoover Dam uh, like surpassed the construction of what you see here, which is Arna Krusha. Arna Krusha is the name of the site where the dam was built. And Sean Kitty made this aller allegorical painting that basically depicts uh, the time of utopia and progress that the Irish were heading towards through establishing electricity around the whole country. Again, Ireland was a very poor, and for many decades continued to be a very poor country, and the government of the New Republic saw that electricity was the definitive factor to revolutionize society. You know? So what's interesting about this artist is that although he made that amazing allegorical, allegorical painting, he also uh, went to the site and documented through painting the construction of um, the dam. So he was obsessed with the uh, machinery that was brought uh, from Germany by the government. The Irish government had made an alliance with Siemens Company to uh, build this dam. And as you can see from Whoever is here and knows of um, iconography art, of art history, it's almost like a constructivist image. You know? It's like a Rochenko, uh, very geometric, obsessed with the machinery, but it's a watercolor that basically is documenting the construction of this dam. And 
These are just images of how it was shown. So this is, again, works from the 20 stories that were loved, and that was kind of like the introduction of the show. This is like, yeah, we understand the size of the painting. And what was radical in that moment uh, was not only the construction of the dam itself, but the electrification of the country, which implied putting electrical poles all across a landscape that had never seen electricity uh, for decades, or in certain cases, even for centuries. So, it, uh, just to go back to the allegorical painting uh, and to decipher you know, the characters, so because it's an allegory, the family there, it's obvious that it's the new Ireland looking towards the future on the right. And the drunken workers represent the unskilled workers, many of them who died. And the, sc uh, the skeleton that you see hanging there has been described both either as representing those who died during the construction, but as you can see, um, it's wearing military garment. So it's also referring to leaving a very deadly past of civil war unrest that uh, was the moment previous to uh, the era that has been depicted here. And these three characters here are quite strong. Um, the engineer, a very Orson Welles looking man, uh, having the plans of the new republic in his hands, being stopped by a guard that somehow represents the older generations. And the very important character, as you can see there, is the priest. A priest who's reading the Bible through candlelight, and a clear secular criticism by the painter towards how the church was looking towards another uh, direction while the whole country was uh, going forward. So that's just an image of uh, for you to have a reference and. The rural electrification scheme went all through the 40s, the 50s. Um, this is a very interesting image that uh, it's kind of like the typical image that many of you in the room might be familiar with the feminist reading on um, electrical devices that were brought to uh, indoors in a way to um, keep uh, the housewife inside and to take. Uh, as they work inside, be having some kind of like a domestic engineer using the electrical devices. And so all of these gender relations also come uh, because of the wonderment of electricity. We keep on forgetting that the, it was a wonderment to have electricity. Uh, we take it for granted as we plug our phones, but at a time where, again, generations had never seen uh, electricity come to their house, it was miraculous. There were artists in the exhibition that uh, were commissioned directly to uh, work on these subjects, yet the exhibition wasn't about that. But I just bring this so that you see like an, an immediate project that developed from an artist called Adrian Duncan from Ireland, who he made a research on how most of the electrical poles that were brought to electrify um, the landscape across the country, a lot of them came from Scandinavia uh, because they were stronger, uh, they were more resistant, and there was a market for it. And he, did, with a, another filmmaker, went to Scandinavia and made an amazing film. I don't have the complete footage, but basically it's this very abstract, sound and very uncanny image where they enter this landscape of snow and suddenly the trees that are covered with snow, they turn into uh, internet servers. Uh, and this, there's this relationship of how the advent of electricity, which started with just giving light, is still running most of our economy, most of our information. No? That's the, um, the main source of how we operate today. It's still electricity. Now, what was important also in the show was to place artists and context where 
the use of electricity was not the same as in most of Western Europe or in most of uh, the westernized world for that matter. So uh, in great part of the exhibition, certain contexts where a lack of electricity uh, exists today was important to present immediately uh, in relation to this discussion. So this is a series of photographs, so this is a very interesting photographs for those who are interested in photography. Uh, Ocho James Iroha, he uh, made this work staged uh, using bodies of collaborators and friends commenting on the lack and the corruption behind uh, the use or the inexistence of electricity in Nigeria. I don't know if you have been to Lagos. Lagos is the biggest uh, metropolis in Africa, yet it has the poorest conditions of electrical service. And you have power cuts all throughout the day. Most of the people actually uh, have to own um, a generator, and it's a city where you hear uh, electrical uh, gasoline generators throughout neighborhoods. And there's a whole mafia around this uh, business. The business of uh, the impoverished context where certain senators would own companies that bring the generators and uh, the story goes on. So for him, he uh, wanted to comment on how currently most of Nigerian society is like enslaved to this context, to the context of being impoverished uh, constantly by the lack of electricity. And today in politics in Nigeria, uh, politicians when they go to campaign, they always like offer the, so the grand solution for electricity in Nigeria. It's become like a, uh, yeah, like part of the political campaign every year. You know? And just to give you an idea, I won't go much in detail, but there were works that would come in through form and image, other ways of understanding this relationship of like the social engineering in relation to um, yeah, services and ways of connecting um, society that the body is affected by all this context. And this is John Rainey, this is a very interesting um, Call it. It's made out of pottery. How do you call it? Ceramics. Ceramics. Yeah. But something important for the show was also to be a little bit more literal on how, in other contexts in the world, and not in the twenties in Ireland, but perhaps more recent, and outside of Europe, there were other artists that reacted to the construction of hydroelectric dams. Like that became like a way of thinking. And sometimes you can make exhibitions that way. Like you can be more poetic and more suggestive, or sometimes you create a specific subject that you identify that can be repeated uh, in different forms of art, but there's a relationship of the subject. So in this case, uh, Liu Xiaodong, who is a very well-known painter from China, from uh, the early 90s. Um, he, as many intellectuals in China in the early 2000s, he went to a valley in China, which was where the Yanxing River was passing, and it was a site that was going to be flooded because of the construction of a dam that the Communist Party had planned since the late 90s. No? This, this dam, which is called the Gorgeous Dam, the Three Gorgeous Dam, uh, was a radical event for uh, Chinese of many generations because the flood that caused the land that was flooded was a valley that had been described throughout centuries by through poetry, through calligraphy, through oral history. It was like this very iconic and uh, mythical landscape that led to many intellectuals like Liu Xiaodong, filmmakers, poets, 
to want to travel there before it flooded. What Yu Xiaodong did, like also this film director, uh, Ya Shangke, uh, was to try to create some kind of visual documentary and a document of cities that were eventually flooded and the people's lives that were uh, changed by the construction of what is still considered the largest uh, hydroelectric dam uh, in present day. In the case of Liu Xiaogong, uh, he went at the same sites as this film director and he painted uh, the inhabitants of the people who were actually hired by the Chinese Communist Party to also destroy their own home because destruction had to be done before the flood happened. It was a part of the part of the process. And as you can see, that's the Yangtzeing River, and the site that you're seeing is now underwater. No? An artist that we commissioned to work more on these ideas of nationhood and dams was. Uh, Malala Andrea Lavis Drazana. She is from Madagascar and Paris. And she did a series of digital collages where she uh, located in banknotes uh, that most of them don't exist in today's currency, where dams were used by governments uh, to promote uh, progress in their own nations. Okay. A lot of them coming from Africa, which is something that she's interested in. And she makes these collages, trying to represent, again, through a, another way of uh, allegory, by maximizing illustration, like a type of art form that uh, is specific to banknotes, no? And creates, like, uh, very interesting relationships that have to do uh, with ideas of progress, also of in some cases colonialism, in some cases process of independence, you feel the notions or uh, the dreams of nationhood through the juxtaposition of uh, those images. But we also had other uh, type of work. This is a, a painting from Inji Atatun. Uh, this work is from the 1960s. Uh, Inji Atatun is an amazing Egyptian surrealist uh, painter. Uh, there was a surrealism group in the 1930s that she belonged to in Egypt, and she was considered like an enemy of the state um, for making a lot of political, social work denouncing like social conditions in Egypt. And when she came out of the prison, uh, she made less politically driven work in, let's say, in the surface, but like this work, there's something that she is criticizing. This is the, a painting that depicts the construction of the Aswan Dam. The Aswan Dam was a dam built uh, in Egypt by Nasser, the head of state of Egypt and the leader of pan-Arab uh, uh, socialism. And the dam was constructed with the help of the Soviet Union. That's Dushchev opening with Nasser, uh, punching uh, the bottom so that the water would flood through uh, the valleys of the Nile. And that was also, like in China, it caused a huge political, cultural effect because a lot of uh, tubes and, and archaeological sites had to be removed because they were uh, endangered. And some of them actually were flooded. Um, this is just an image for your readers. Now, um, this is the last, let's say, more literal <laughs> uh, work related to dance and nation, uh, more of a recent work. Alexander Apostol, he's an artist from Venezuela, and he filmed a, like a semi-fictional uh, three-channel video where characters are inside the interior of a dam that existed in Venezuela, that in the 70s, it was decorated by the kinetic artist Carlos Cruz Diaz. So the three-channel video is made by Apostol, but the interior, the color walls, which still exist today, are the kinetic work of a very famous Venezuelan artist who 
showed in signals for those who are familiar with the gallery that David Medalla used to co-run in London. So it was one of these Latin American artists in Europe that did a lot of kinetic optical work. And he became a little bit of a dandy of the nation. Like when certain optic art in the sense became instrumentalized as the art of the nation. No? And again, somehow like in Sean Keating, the painter, you see these relationships of art and, and, and the discourse of nation, but in very different is that Sean Keating wasn't um, a painter of the Republic. You know? he, he had some certain authorship, like in this case, art is definitely on as part of the construction of the revolution of progress and I, ideas of uh, development. No? But what interested me in this exhibition was not only to, let's say, highlight all these damn histories, <laughs> but um, to try to bring back notions of how electricity is still like this. Um, you can sit down. There's, there's two chairs here. Yeah. But to see how electricity is still kind of like a marker of understanding uh, development and progress. And this is one of the examples on how to bring some criticality to that discussion. And this is the work of Jaime Avila. It's a diptych where he photographs a homeless in a very dramatic uh, perspective in Bogota, one of most violent cities in uh, South America. I'm from there. And I can say that. <laughs> and uh, he juxtaposes it with another uh, perspective where he introduces in the photographs to the, that accompany the photograph, bulb lights, um, reminding us of the city that runs on light and the city that has disenfranchised and the person that is next to it, or the person that is not part of that, uh, that process of development in regardless of the form that it's taking place in this case in Bogota. No? Uh, this type of work was for example presented next to uh, realist paintings by an artist that applied to this open call system that I mentioned at the beginning. So as you can see, the juxtaposition of different medium and different context is something that uh, I tend to do in my curatorial work. This is, as I mentioned, a realist painting. These are like just normal Irish knights that he depicts, but there's something very uncanny about them. No? There's something that feels a certain tension to them. And, uh, in order to extend that tension related to light and the city and urbanism. Uh, there were works, for example, by Stephen Cohen. Stephen Cohen is a South African choreographer, uh, a white South African choreographer. It's important for him to stay and to relate to his work. He uh, has this iconic piece where he cross-dresses into this chandelier object that has like an electric device, and he entered in 2006 a neighborhood in Johannesburg under this bridge that you see at the back that was meant to be uh, gentrified as part of a grand beautification project in Johannesburg. And so he creates an action where he beautifully yet violently enters and announces, almost like an angel, uh, the future of the site, no? And it's a very intense intervention where he makes very slow movements, he falls, some people are very, are aggressive, others dance with him, and the video goes on, no? The chandelier in the exhibition had like, uh, it, would, it became like a late motif in the show. Um, sometimes also when you make exhibitions, as I said, um, one of the options. <laughs> it's not like there's one way to do it, but there's 
And there are like more things that visually can come within the exhibition to remember the audience very in a very retinal reference of certain idea. No? So the chandelier became kind of like this leitmotif in the show, partly because the chandelier represents that uh, light, that source of light that uh, still carries a lot of uh, class struggle. No? Uh, the chandelier re would represent status, taste, um, tensions um, of class that can translate in different contexts. One of the works on Chandelier uh, is the work of Gonzalo Juan Mayor. Uh, he painted, this is drawn actually from charcoal, and it's a banana branch at the top which stains uh, Chandelier, and that's where you uh, really see visually, again, like this um, class struggle that the Chandelier might and be referred as. No? Or in this work of Lee Bull, um, she is a Korean artist, and in her case, the chandelier became also an architectural form. Uh, she made this off hanging objects in relation to utopian cities that uh, she studied made from architects and urbanists from the 1920s in Europe that were uh, very much uh, creating architecture that was composed of transparency and light. And she created like this object that would uh, emphasize like that utopian project. This is like a, a detail of it. No? It becomes like between a jewel, but when you go close to other materiality, most of the structure is made from um, that, that mental material that is behind uh, PCs. Like, it, there's something in the, in the materiality that is again between a crystal, but also like a hardware, and it's a very interesting project that kind of like resonated also with real utopia projects that uh, became more concrete, and uh, this was more like a gesture that I, I wanted to also make in relation to Irish history in the exhibition. This is a light by Eileen Gray. I don't know who's an architect or designer here, but Eileen Gray is like this fundamental uh, female architect um, who was contemporaneous to the Corbusier and out of laws. She was Irish and left Ireland in a very early stage I moved to Paris and she, uh, one of her iconic lamps is this very reductionist um, lamp, uh, which back then was almost seen as sci-fi, you know? Uh, she made this in 1927. This is a lamp from 1927. So it kind of like resonates with this uh, utopian thinking within a concrete design object. And it brought literally light into the exhibition. For those who just came in, more, the context of electricity uh, as the subject and the ramification of different subjects of electricity is what some of the works are being presented here. This is the biennial that I created uh, this year in Ireland. And speaking specifically of utopian, going back to nationhood, uh, one of the works that I was very happy to present was the work of Dominique González Forsted. Um, Dominique did a work in 2006 where she made this huge, um, uh, like, fake ground made out of a uh, green carpet. And it was like, I don't know, like 20 meters. You, know? you really felt like the notion of a ground or an architectural experience. And she just placed a, a sign saying Brasilia Hall. For those who might know, Brasilia is the uh, iconic uh, modern architecture city that was done from scratch in the 1960s at the capital of Brazil. And she placed this uh, at the back of this huge space, a screen 
where you see a footage of the construction of Brasilia. No? This is something that now I'm just will make like a parenthesis on how you can make a very big size installation without a, not much, no? <laughs> which is something that uh, in the format of a biennial is interesting also economically, <laughs> because you think like, oh, I mean, Dominic Gonzalez Forster has like very complex uh, installations that involve retro projections, uh, objects, I don't know. Yet this is a very effective, yet street and hugely monumental. You know? It's monumental both because of the size, but immediately when you see the sign, your mind takes you to an architectural landscape. You, know? you imagine like a city, and then there's this huge platform uh, of thinking. By thinking, I mean when you enter that space, the space of crossing from one side to the other, it becomes a ground for you to start wondering, like, what is this new site of a government? Why government? Because Brasilia, again, was built as a capital, as a new utopian. For me, uh, it was important to try to relate how that painting of, um, that we saw at the beginning with the hydroelectric dam was a sign of huge modernity, you know? like to try to relate how electricity making that hydroelectric dam was simultaneous to, or can be compared to the construction of Brasilia in the 1960s. No? Now, uh, going towards the end, um, this is a work by uh, John Gerard. Um, he was perhaps the artist who brought um, back the wonderment on electricity or on energy uh, to the present, because when we think of hydroelectric dams today, it doesn't have the same effect of wonderment that it might have had in the 1920s, right? Like the painting or the way that that painting was built was really to show how this massive concrete that was blocking water was something completely like almost sci-fi, no? Almost like when you see the movie Metropolis, it was really how these forms of industrialization were really like changing the world in life. But again, when we see nowadays a hydroelectric dam, we don't have that effect. John Gerard, he brought that uh, through an, a work, which is an incredible uh, piece. It's a retro projection. He creates a cube. Uh, the projector is in, inside this cube and projects towards the screen. The, video that you see is not actually a video. It's, a, um, it's an animation, but live, that is uh, rendered by the real time of a site in Arizona, which you see represented here. It's a solar power plant which exists in Nevada. I would say Nevada. And basically, how it works is that the, what you see circling around this um, structure are solar panels. And the solar panels have their own motor system that they move in relation to uh, the direction of the sun. And there's a mirror structure right on top of this tower that uh, creates even more reflection towards the power screen. So they try to create as much energy as possible. Like, this exists. This is the new, like, this is the future. And salts, but batteries made out of salts, are <coughs> under the ground. And all the energy that these screens are collecting, they charge this salt, and that's what's generating the electricity. You know? So again, yes, there's this wonderment again. But there's also a very spiritual notion. Like, what's interesting about this piece is how when people are looking at it, and this is like in very slow motion, and what, when I meant that it, it's in real time is that if it's 12 in Nevada, like in the morning, it will be 12 in the screen. You know? It's not a video. It's really like, almost like a clock. You know? And so, uh, this notion of spirituality really comes 
uh, in the piece, and it's something that resonated in other works, to try to understand what could be other more metaphoric ways of understanding light, which is not only electricity, no? So, like the light, trying to find works that related spirituality and representations of the soul in relation to light. So this was, for example, one of those works, a work that you might be, you guys might be familiar with. It's uh, one of those beautiful uh, solar, solarized prints uh, by Bruce Conner, which were, one of them was shown in the uh, Bruce Conner exhibition here at the Leia Sartes project. And it really shows, uh, as I've said, how there is something inside in, in which light is used to represent that insight, a certain interiority, you know? If you're interested in how the artist made this, uh, he basically had a light projector behind him while a uh, paper of photography was in front of him and he created different movements throughout time to create this, uh, this imagery. And another uh, historical reference in Ireland that uh, was brought into the, this discussion and also in the, in the room of Bruce Conner was uh, an artist called Mamie Gillette, uh, Irish who in the 1920s went to live in Paris and became part of the avant-garde there and was a Faubist, a Cubist, trying to represent through light and color a certain spirituality. But what's interesting about her Cubism and Taoism is that she still depicts um, Catholic iconography. Um, and that became like her image. It's like a super interesting depiction and you can see kind of like the tension of trying to negotiate Catholic tradition with uh, being part of the modern uh, revolution. You know? this and in front of the Bruce Conner um, there was a work by an artist called Pampalo Cherry. I'm sorry that the title is not there but Pampalo made kind of like an opposite and more contemporaneous way of understanding the absence of a certain interiority in today's uh, iconography and today's self-representation this grid of photographs they're actually not silhouettes. They are photographs in which he actually plays somehow like Bruce Conner, a light behind him and took a photo. And so they're, how do you call that? Counter light? Uh, Contrast. Yes, contrast. Contrast, yeah. When you go very close to them, you actually do see the shades of yes. volume, you know? And it's he himself, like he repeats himself with just different uh, types of clothing or accessories, kind of like commenting, and because of the, form, the square format, one might say it has to do with the construction of the self in social media. There's something, again, that is, there is an absence of an interior light, which is different to the interior of uh, Bruce Carter. So, that's Maybe you see in here that when you see, saw the work from one angle, you actually saw the reflection of the other artist. And this, this let's say, museum design moments only happen when you do the actual hanging. No? Um, I'll just go fast to this. Uh, this is um, Isabel Nolan. Uh, this is an artist, again, that brought the label tip of the chandelier, but in her case, uh, there's something related to religion. She wanted to create a, a kind of like uncanny, um, like penetration. She wouldn't call it that way, but <laughs> 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 intrusion to the church and trying to uh, unpack like trauma and relationship to tradition of really uh, of religion uh, and of memories that uh, she has in relation to what is uh, still the power of the church uh, in Ireland and I'll talk about that later in a more extended way but this is also related to that 
This is also work, his historical work, but not from the 30s, but this is from the 90s. Uh, Rita Daphne, she uh, is an artist from the North. Many artists in the North uh, throughout the 80s and early 90s created work related to what's uh, called the Troubles, uh, which are still the insurrection of uh, the Irish against the uh, oppressive invasion of and uh, presence of the British. And this is a very interesting painting, as you can see. She depicts the dichotomy of uh, Catholics and Protestants uh, in the North, divided, the wall, divided by a wall. Uh, exteriorizing hatred is clearly like an expressionist painter, painting where the Catholics to the church now are uh, seen as uh, the enemy and likewise uh, from the others. No? And this is also a very divisional painting like the other one. Uh, it's three canvases gathered together. Again, the Irish Catholic family and the English British family to the left. Uh, these are a work from 1994. But those tensions still exist in today art, today's Ireland. It's nothing. It's not something that has passed. Um, the series of photographs by John Duncan reminds us that this is very, uh, like, neutral photography, Germanic style of depiction you know, of a, a certain object uh, happening in a site in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, where it is a custom. Uh, in June, I believe, that people uh, who are known as loyalists, who are basically uh, English or identified as Protestant uh, English, can burn bonfires to exteriorize their hatred towards the Irish. <laughs> so <laughs> this exists still today. Now it has, I mean, in culturally, it has become a bit of like a 4th of July, like uh, people just do it because it's a tradition. If you see, there's a very interesting Vice documentary of uh, a reporter that actually goes into how very like all right nationalist loyalists uh, really use this as a way to like recruit. And in today's context of Brexit, this actually has fueled because the notion of the border in Ireland uh, has become, uh, yet again, a subject, no? Uh, Ireland will not only be most likely divided, but it will become the new border of Europe. Uh, because Ireland is, also is part of the European Union, so when the British would leave the EU, eventually the border would mark again a new border in Europe, no? This is uh, yeah, an installation shot. I won't go through this. How is our timing? Who's taking our time? 15 minutes. Huh? 15 minutes. Okay, okay. So, um, yes, a combination of a different type of work to try to, ex to open the conversation on this subject but through another spectrum uh, would be this type of work like Patrizio Massimo. He's an Italian artist who uh, makes this very particular type of painting. And I thought that it was be this is an interesting way of trying to like depict dichotomy when you think of like the tensions of Protestants and Catholics there's always yeah this uh, this is a this is a, a struggle, and yet again the struggle is between people who at the end are the same. You no, know? in the case of the painting so uh, Rita, the divided wall, she basically tells us that they're basically the same. They're families. They're all coming. We're born in this uh, island or in this world, and they hate each other for the same reasons, no? Yet, they are essentially the same, no? So, uh, this painting 
of the transgender couple of Patricio, and Patricio himself depicts himself wearing uh, this lingerie, is placed next to this other uncanny object which he calls the mother. Uh, this tassel is a series of works that he has uh, to depict uh, family members. Uh, another context that was interesting to bring also in relation to a dichotomy was the work of a Dominican artist called uh, David Scarpa. And he uh, made a performance which was documented in video and we showed the video. The performance was done in Dominican Republic and Dominican Republic, if you're not familiar with the geography, is this island which sh shares territory with Haiti. So, Haiti is to the left and Dominican Republic is to the right. And Haitians are always othered constantly in Dominican Republic as the incoming immigrant, the enemy of the state, the black invasion from what the Dominicans conceive as their non-black uh, society. Uh, it's constantly, the, the tension is intensified uh, throughout the years and the artist to try to comment in, into this uh, violence that occurs through uh, speech or through representation in the media, he made a performance where he had a Dominican uh, man, a blind Dominican man, holding a um, in, uh, disabled uh, Haitian woman whose legs are missing, and they walk through the streets of Santo Domingo by guiding each other. So the Haitian woman, who is the only one that can see from the couple, instructs him as they walk and pass through streets. And it's kind of like this representation of those tensions that exist uh, in the island. That video was presented there to the right. And it was presented very close to this painting by uh, Juan Davila, an artist from Australia, Chilean, but born in Australia. Uh, sorry, Ch Chilean, based in Australia. This is part of a series of paintings that he has done commenting on today's uh, fear of Australians on the influx of immigrants that's been happening well for many decades. But as you know, if you're not aware, Australia has created all these islands where uh, detention centers uh, have been built. And the policy of those detention centers occurred in the years that this artist uh, has uh, annotated to the left of the painting. And this is a more like a surreal uh, painting. I mean, surreal, to, speaking about reality, but surreal in terms of of its composition, but a very colonial subject, uh, which is quite a, easy to identify. The very Anglo-Saxon uh, head is holding like this piece of gold, claiming like the ownership of um, of the land. No? I'll go straight like this. Okay, so I'll just uh, finish with. Uh, how in the process of making the Biennial, even though I was very much involved and excited about this whole context of electricity, the painting of Sean Keating and all these narratives that were weaving together, there was also like an immediate reality that was difficult to uh, ignore. No? And sometimes Biennials, I think personally, uh, or exhibitions in general, projects or ideas for that matter, can't really uh, ignore the immediate context. No? Like, what is actually happening? So when I propose the exhibition, I always call it that there wasn't a specific thematic, but that there would be different exhibitions exploring specific moments and narrative that they will be together. But the starting point was that painting of Sean Keats. But there wasn't this single aspect like the show was never described that this exhibition is about electricity. No? But it was like about the nation, the self, progress, da, da, da. And the immediate context that was happening at the time of making the biennial was um, 
the whole uh, civil uh, debate around abortion and the referendum for abortion rights in Ireland. I don't know if you guys followed it, but basically Ireland has had uh, the most um, strict and backwards in, for Western Europe standards uh, laws of abortion. And in the 80s, there was a referendum that actually created a law where, as it stated in the books, the child would have the same rights as the mother. There's the same rights as the mother. And there has been all this interpretation of the law of, of first, like, when is it a child, all the things that we know about politics of, and discussions around abortion. But the referendum that was going, that happened actually this year was the referendum to change that, yeah? It's a, to change specifically that law that was brought in the A's. Now, in the time of making the Biennial, streets of Ireland will fill with primarily a campaign against the referendum. No, the people had to vote it to vote no. Voting no for the referendum meant that the law from the 80s would be kept. And there was this very strange also language that used anti-colonial discourse, like liberal anti-colonial <coughs> discourse, instrumentalized towards the no campaign. So as you can see here, say in England, one in five babies are aborted. Don't bring this to Ireland, vote no. So people, in, women in Ireland who uh, can uh, and have the access to have an abortion, they actually travel to England, which is, I don't know, a Ryan era way. Uh, it, it is a cheap flight, but not, it is not easy for, for most of people. But those who do it, they basically go to, uh, to England, abort and come back. But it's actually a very traumatic notion of like going to the airport thinking of all what comes across to try to get out of the country and uh, come back. And that, uh, those campaigns were highly fueled by the Catholic establishment, as you can imagine. And that reminded me something back again to the painting of Sean Keating of that, uh, that figure of the priest in the, corner, in the right uh, bottom corner. Uh, Sean Keating described the church at that time as being busy with a kingdom that is out of this world. No? I'm paraphrasing, but he constantly referred through the depiction of the priest reading the Bible up with candlelight as this, the past and the traditional structure that was keeping the country from moving forward. So, great part of the exhibition actually was evolving around this discussion. Uh, so there was this whole discussion that I just explained about dams, electricity, progress nation, but there was also this discussion that was another way of understanding how incomplete was the uh, project of the nation. So, one of the most iconic works of the exhibition was Sanya Ivankovic. Uh, this is from uh, the site in the Biennium. She did this statue, which is part of a more complex project that involves some archive material that was inside an exhibition space. Uh, this is a piece called Rosa of Luxembourg, uh, referring to Rosa Luxembourg, not the communist leader in uh, Germany. And the work consisted of this um, pregnant and allegory, they call that allegory? Yes, a female allegory. And the pedestal, which was like, I don't know, maybe 12 meters high, below had this uh, names, words that she brought up, and specifically ending with bitch, 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 was a way to remember how at the end, most of those, as you saw, the posters of the No campaign, uh, would be a constant moral war against uh, diminishing the morality of the women who took the decision to uh, 
to abort. No? There's, there's this constant uh, moral lynching uh, towards women who take their right to have an abortion. So to give you a little bit more of context on how that work originated, we didn't make that work for the first time. She actually did it when she was invited to Luxembourg, uh, where the main monument of Luxembourg is this Nike, uh, the Greek allegory goddess of liberty and freedom. And Nike, as many female allegories, was used in a monument to represent the heroism of men. In this case, the war memorial that was commemorating the First World War and the Second World War. All the names that you see here that in her piece say Kunst, Liberté, Bitch, in the original monument in Luxembourg, it says all the names of uh, men who died in Luxembourg and who are commemorated and who are known to history as the heroes for Luxembourg's uh, participation in World War I and World War II. Sanya, who comes from Yugoslavia, sorry, um, and who grew up actually in a context where uh, women uh, partisans are, were heroized, where women's names in history books in Yugoslavia were known for many generations of who were the women who fought against fascists and uh, Nazism. Uh, she wanted to comment on the absence of women in that monument. And how she did it was to create another monument that was placed in front or next to this one. And by celebrating the womanhood of uh, Nikkei, the, the Greek allegory for freedom and liberty. Now, in the context of our show, what I thought it was interesting to bring this is that on one hand, people would first relate like, it is an object that brings the subject of pregnancy as a political debate, as a, not as a private um, affair, which should be, but it brings this constant debate on why is it that pregnancy becomes a social public matter. You know? Because the problem with the referendum of the 80s was that in the moment that the government of Ireland gave the rights, the equal rights of the baby to the mother, the moment that any woman become, became pregnant, their body didn't belong to her, it belonged to the state. So bringing back this discussion as through the object was important. And what's interesting about Sanya's work is that she both rem reminds us, as I said, of the denigrating uh, social uh, lynching that happens around abortion, but she also heroizes and celebrates womanhood, or the right to be pregnant whenever you wish to be pregnant. No? So it's like this. It's not an ambivalent uh, object, it's more like she's placing a real discussion, you know, rather than a fake narrative as many monuments uh, like the one in Luxembourg does. Um, I'll just finish with that and how a collective work uh, by artists from Ireland uh, took this and was the work that was mostly related to the referendum was a uh, collective that participated in the open call. Uh, this is kind of like how I got to know more of them. And this is a group of artists that uh, in the past three years had already started to create events, performances, actions, exhibitions around abortion rights. Mm -hmm. And for EVA International, we basically gave them uh, the platform to create a procession that borrowed the language of religious processions and we managed to block the streets, uh, the main streets of Limerick in the uh, day of the opening and that's how, let's say, the ceremony of the opening of the biennial happened. So I'll just finish with that. Before this edifice, which was once Limerick's Magdalene Laundry, 
where pregnant women and girls were shamed, incarcerated, and enslaved, and their children taken from them, brutalized, and sold. Sorry, just to give you a context, the, um, uh, the eighth being cross refers to the repeal of the eighth movement, so the eighth amendment was the law that I just described of the rights of the child the same as women, and so that was like their main logo. With this procession, we honor their memory today, and we carry them with us through the streets of the city from which they were barred. The Eighth Amendment is another attempt to stigmatize, brutalize, and control women, and we reject it. We proudly walk these streets today, reclaiming them from our dark and judgmental past. Rejoicing in our power to change what is wrong, we speak with one voice, and we are the artist campaign to repeal the Eighth Amendment.
Whoever has questions or wants to know a little bit more. The Constitution does not stop abortion from happening in Ireland. That is a fact. Instead of. I have a question. After the procession that was staged for uh, Eva, was there any government, any kind of reaction to the procession or any of the statements that the women made? I'm curious. It was such a. It's a pretty explosive topic. Yeah, uh, we did actually had to deal with the uh, sponsorship, like not them writing, but we had like audience letting us know that they had written to some of our sponsorships to let them know that they're supporting a project that is supporting the abortion sector. <coughs> because obviously Eva, most of the budget comes from the Arts Council, no? so, but it's a good question to ask also in a way, how do you as an organizer try to control that? Uh, for example, we all the time describe that everything that ha had to do with this project, none of public money was used for that, no? So constantly, like either through a press release or, yeah. But we never really had, Discussions. I mean, the thing is that at that time, it did, it did felt, and it eventually, the, when the referendum happened, uh, the yes won. So the referendum is happening. No? Mm -hmm. uh, but there was, yeah, there, there was definitely uh, like this aftermath that we had to then deal with, including like aside from the procession in the exhibition site, one of the exhibition spaces. The artist campaign to recuperate, they also had like a uh, display of uh, testimonies, uh, archive material, like they had like a station. So that is it, it was not only the procession, like their participation. And we actually had, I mean, that was something that they were just not careful of, that they had uh, testimonies of people that they had asked like their permission for a specific moment when they had done a video, let's say. Because they started like this campaign like three years ago, but they hadn't told them that it was happening then. Mm -hmm. So things like that started to deal, but nothing major, you know? Yeah. I just wanted to open up the discussion about um, your practice as a curator and working in very like precarious contexts. How do you make that call when you decide to come in to a specific context? Not also, also not be coming from that specific, um, let's say, country, um, and knowing that it is you're you're working within a very controversial um, or very uh, unstable political situation. I mean, and. Like, at which point do you, because I, I, I can imagine, you know, not all exhibitions that we go to or um, even festivals or biennials um, have this like level of, or degree in which they address a very specific issue or they lightly kind of touch up on something. Um, I mean, this is, I guess, on how you make that call personally. Um, and secondly, do you believe that these types of festivals or that artists should directly engage in these um, issues that, like, as you said, immediate, immediate context? Yeah. Well, I mean, in this very peculiar case, I think it was the, um, like, the existing artistic uh, response or the, artist, the artist community response to the matter that was already happening, you know, that um, these were specifically very well organized artists that were really making art practice in a context of activism of a specific uh, fight for civil rights. I mean, I see it as how that community intervened to a wider discussion of civil rights. And 
they brought um, in previous uh, events before this, uh, they would, let's say, go to what would be the official strike or the official protest of people who were uh, campaigning for uh, the yes repudiate, but being artists, eventually they actually would like make props and dress up and that they created, let's say what would be the, a very similar case that I see is maybe some of you in the room are familiar with the context of the AIDS crisis in the 80s in the US when artists were very much involved in the act of uh, movements by creating props and posters and imagery that only through art practice they contributed to a wider discussion and they, let's say, revolutionized that moment or activated. In my case, for this, I, and I bring this slide that I didn't present it. Although I am interested in bringing or discussing, and I do think that major exhibitions, especially exhibitions that have public money, should speak about what's happening in the public or in the public arena. Um, and uh, uh, equally important is, is also to uh, stimulate comparisons with other contexts, because sometimes other contexts bring even more awareness to how complex or yeah, difficult the, the local narrative is, uh, or where it could lead to, or where those provincial discussions have actually become even more problematic in other moments of history or in other geography. So um, I bring this in the case of a work by Aki Ba. Uh, he's an Indonesian artist. And uh, he has photographed remaining reliefs that were made during the Suharto regime in Indonesia uh, during the, uh, how's it called, the New Society? Sorry, the new society. The new society. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I think it's the new society. Wait, I'm gonna remember now. But so hard to yes, equally in the uh, authoritarian uh, project, there was a project to conceive the nuclear family. What was conceived as the nuclear family. So uh, throughout Indonesia, uh, reliefs and imagery of what was to be the nuclear family were uh, placed all around schools, public areas, and these reliefs still remain there. And today, uh, artists, uh, not artists, community still paints them or guards them, or some of them have been left to ruins. And the artist has depicted uh, these existing reliefs. I mean, seeing them today, they go beyond the notion of controlling a nation through the birth control, or uh, this is the most iconic representation of uh, social engineering by uh, authoritarian government. Uh, from a queer uh, gaze, no? in, in the sense that your queer perspective over the world uh, obviously shows that the nuclear family is also heteronormative, and so the constant um, uh, care of a community towards a uh, conceived nuclear family that was uh, projected from uh, the 1960s and 1970s, the, like to the persistence of that idea of the nuclear family um, restores and reaffirms and fixates the idea of family as being a heteronormative family. No? And I bring this uh, in the discussion also of abortion rights because it's also how the state controls bodies, no? That controls private life. <coughs> and bringing this uh, type of work and context in Indonesia from 16 onwards to, this was for example displayed next to the pregnant uh, statue. It's something that I'm, I would say that I'm more 
personally interested. It's not only like to resurface and be like resurface discussions that are happening locally, but also um, bring them in comparison to what's happening in other in other places. No? I think mean, I think it's a simultaneous thing uh, to do it simultaneously. No? Um, I guess, what are some of the themes locally or some of the issues locally that you're hoping to address? Like just themes that you want to promote, really, in, in your time here. It doesn't have to be overly specific, you know, just what you're looking to promote or address. You're putting me on the spot. No, I mean, I would say that there is a great deal of existing practice here that is already uh, context responsive, and that's what makes actually art scenes in the Philippines uh, one of the most interesting in Southeast Asia. Uh, also, the level of discourse because of the educational uh, sophistication of many uh, artists formed in the educational system brings uh, more depth into the discussion of being context responsive, no? I guess, and maybe this comes from a discussion that we were having earlier this week with some friends, is to how to, like, denationalize the discussion. <laughs> uh, but by denationalizing, it's not meaning to be cosmopolitan for the sake of being cosmopolitan, but uh, I find it personally fascinating as a researcher, as a researcher, the notion of nation and culture in the Philippines, like because there's so much discussed and brought. And, uh, but I guess it would be interesting on our part to try to contribute in another way that is uh, not producing myths of nation. Yeah? I mean, when I. Uh, it, and it's not about not talking about nation, but talking about in another way, you know? And again, I'm very open to a diversity of possibilities, that it's not only, I don't know, super researched, uh, essayistic, exhibition making, it can also be very much to starting from materiality or, I don't know, there's, uh, yeah. But I think the context here itself is already very context responsive, no? Uh, I guess we would have to see, like, yeah, how to contribute uh, with, I don't know, a transversal discussion, no? Um, we are, I mean, we are having a, an idea of making the uh, outposts where we are now more of a uh, educational platform. So try to bring more people to speak and create like more uh, closed door seminars where you can enroll and you can be part of the discussion that would lead us towards thinking how can we uh, propose that transversal discussion. No? Uh, so I think that's going to be like more of the beginning process. No? Like, Creating like a thing and through certain people that will be some of our residents that will teach uh, in this closed door uh, seminars that you will know more about uh, early in the year of 2019. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that was my diplomatic answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess maybe some already, maybe this is already kind of implicit in your talk, but I, I wonder if it's possible for you to talk about um, like plans for what will happen in Bataan. I mean, I'm, and I'm specifically curious like what the time frame was for the Eva Biennial. I, I love the sense of the whole project as a kind of research project for you and the kind of unexpected connections and 
you, you mentioned in the case of the Bruce Connor and, and the other photographs are kind of unexpected juxtapositions that only happened, you know, as you were installing it. So it seems like um, there was like a process and a, a kind of way that the thinking and the choices evolved over time and gave it a certain richness rather than just sort of imposing ideas from the beginning or something. So I'm curious about like how, how long that was and, and yeah, how that compares to what you might be doing now. I want to talk so much specific about the like uh, projects for Batan, so concrete, but um, Batan is our main headquarters where residents, uh, residences happen. And um, but yeah, I mean, just uh, to answer very direct. So that I was uh, appointed like a year and a half before the exhibition, which is like a good time for a biennial. And the budget was not, it's not a, like a big by any, so we tried to play with also like formats of, uh, I mean, for example, this work that I didn't talk about uh, is, as you can see, just very small painting, but to, to try to create some, some kind of body of presence in the, in the work, it's all these things that you uh, think along with the artist by the decision of painting the color of the wall in a certain way so that it creates more body to the work. And this piece, uh, you might have noticed, is our reductions uh, of real photographs of uh, refugees or immigrants crossing borders uh, in Gibraltar or in other borders of Europe. And, uh, This, uh, it all depends. I mean, I think that every time that you make a project, you have to, like, to create, like, a new ethics, always, you know? Because it depends on the institution, who's behind the institution, how does it work, uh, who is the audience, what are the politics, and, and it becomes, yeah, it's, uh, you have to, there isn't a formula to make, sorry, give my mic. There isn't a formula to give, um, to create something. No, I, I, can't, I wouldn't say that I can replicate, yeah? Like this format, uh, because contexts are different. Maybe some contexts are similar, I don't know. When I see the, uh, uh, the painting by Sean Keating, I mean, I always said it was like, in, within my context that it was like Diego Rivera, the Diego Rivera of Ireland. <laughs> yeah. I was always describing it there like, and someone in the opening said, uh, you know, actually, it's, it, he wasn't the Diego Rivera, he was the Frida Kahlo. <laughs> <Someone said. laughs> because apparently, uh, Sean Keating would go to openings dressed up, not as an English man, which the English fashion state today, uh, but as a peasant from the West, wearing like traditional clothing and with very big boots and anyway, so he dressed up like Frida Kahlo. What I was going to say in the context of here, one, perhaps, perhaps, this might be a stretch, but Shankitin represents in the conscience of Irish history something like one Luna, you know? uh, This is anti-colonial painting, no? in a sense that he, well, Luna was a strange anti-colonial. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes. laughs> but he himself should get in as well. I mean, he was a very Republican, like very nationalistic uh, painter, uh, Sean Kitty, uh, trying to depict like this is, this is the new island, no? but the new island is connected through electricity, this is the future, not like, that's what I mean about going there, sorry. I said that it was a stretch. <laughs> but uh, I am interested to research for now this variety of work here, no? so I, what I feel is that 
those juxtapositions. How are, uh, I like personally, I find I find them fascinating that they are already in the museum. You know, when you visit the Met Museum or many exhibitions here, uh, those juxtapositions uh, do exist. Then, I mean, I personally like it. Now, that makes me now think like, okay, so what will be like? What could be another contribution? You know? Uh, which is not joining this process of modernization and postcoloniality with the contemporary. Like there must be something else that you have to help me find out. Nobody else has questions. Thank you so much. Thank you.